Welcome to the John Adams. My name is Tracy Metz. And welcome to our guest of honor this evening, Neil Ferguson, and to our moderator, Walter van Noort. Ferguson wanted to take a break after writing the first volume of the biography of Henry Kissinger, and he wanted to do something fun. So he thought, okay, I'll write a book called Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, translated into Dutch as Rampspoed, Politiek ten tijde van Katastrofe by publishing house Hollands Diep. In it, he shows that disasters and catastrophes are not just something which happened to us, in the face of which we are powerless, but are often man-made. Will we have learned anything from this pandemic? Wait and see. I hope you'll send us your questions via the chat at the bottom of your screen. I'm here to pass them on. We also have some questions that followers of Walter van Noord sent in via LinkedIn and Twitter. Over to you, Walter. Yeah, Neil Ferguson, Professor Neil Ferguson, I should say. And uh, for all the viewers, I would like to provide him with a proper introduction, as if he really needed one. Um, Professor uh, Neil Ferguson, a historian at Stanford University, ex-Harvard, ex-Oxford, uh, ex-London School of Economics. You might have heard of these universities. <laughs> Um, and, of course, author of a dozen best-selling books about history, uh, history of money, history of power, history of networks. Networks is a, in, an important theme in uh, his work. Uh, but as a historian, Neil, you seem almost as interested in the future as in history, right? Am I correct? That's right, uh, Wouter. The reason that I write history is not just because the past is fascinating, in its own right, but to try to understand our, our present predicament and plausible futures that we may face. And this is not a, an original approach. The great Oxford philosopher of history, R.G. Collingwood, made the argument in 1939 that the point of studying the past was to understand our own time better. That's always been my approach. It's the reason that I get out of bed in the morning and write books. Yeah, and you seem to have this antenna for the zeitgeist, uh, so to say. Um, right when the financial crisis struck, uh, you wrote the book The Ascent of Money. Right before the social media dystopia became apparent, you wrote The Tower in the Square, which was about how power fluctuates from hierarchies to networks, from towers to squares uh, throughout history. Uh, and now you come up with a book called Doom, about pandemics, about disasters, about uh, catastrophe, um, in which you argue that uh, this pandemic has essentially shown that we, um, as a society, have grown less apt in handling uh, disaster and have become less resilient for uh, the, the doom and gloom of the future, right? That's right. It's a somewhat paradoxical argument. Uh, the idea that we've grown far more scientifically sophisticated as a species would lead you to assume that we had also got better at managing disasters. And in some ways, uh, we have improved. We understand much better the nature of an infectious disease than our medieval uh, forebears who in the mid 14th century were struck by the worst of all pandemics the bubonic uh, plague that we remember as the Black Death. But, and this is a central argument of, of doom, as we've grown more sophisticated, we've also grown more numerous and more interconnected. And that has in fact increased our vulnerability uh, to all kinds of, of contagion. So we actually are in some ways more fragile than, than we were when we were less numerous and, and less connected. I think there's also a second point, which is that the bureaucratic state that characterizes the early 21st century seems less nimble, uh, seems slower to respond in an emergency than perhaps was true 50 uh, or 60 or 70 years ago. And that, that means that something is working less well in relatively uh, in a relatively recent time frame. Yeah, at, at the same time, it's quite a counterintuitive uh, argument you make, right? Because for all the technologies, for all the innovations, for all the new ways of organizing our, ourselves, you stress that that has made us more vulnerable instead of uh, less so. 
Well, that's right. I mean, think about the speed with which uh, the new virus SARS-CoV-2 spread uh, from Wuhan uh, at the beginning of, of 2020. Never before had there been so many direct flights from uh, Wuhan to multiple Western capitals, including San Francisco, the city that I normally live uh, close to. Think also of the ways in which uh, we as a species have become more vulnerable precisely by living longer. Uh, we are an elderly uh, species compared with the humanity of 100 years ago, and that means that there are a lot of relatively vulnerable people. Uh, there are also a great many more obese people than used to be the case. They turned out to be very vulnerable uh, to the new uh, virus. So I, I guess the argument could be summed up uh, in the following way. We, we take two steps forward in scientific understanding, and then maybe one or one and a half steps backward in, in making ourselves more vulnerable uh, to contagions, and not only to contagions, because I want to emphasize that Doom is not a book about COVID, uh, and it's not just a book about pandemics. It's a general history of disasters of all kinds, yeah, it's, uh, including actually, man-made disasters, as we tend to think of them. Actually, you, you propose a sort of general theory of disaster, in a way, right? And, um, That's right. I, I felt that we, we lacked a book that brought all the different kinds of disaster together and under one roof between uh, one dust jacket to show, as I thought I could, that there are certain common features. Uh, even although at first you think there's a big distinction between natural and man-made disasters, in fact, as I try to show, that distinction's a rather artificial one because it's really human decisions that determine how far a natural shock results in excess mortality. A volcanic eruption is clearly a natural phenomenon, but it depends a lot on how many cities that you've built next to the volcano, how many people end up dying. Uh, an uninhabited island can have a volcanic eruption with almost no consequences. Yeah. But if you build a city next to the volcano, think of Naples, then then of course the, the disaster will have, uh, will have much higher casualties. And we, By we, the way, this is not seen, a new idea. We've all seen very vividly also last year how policy decisions and uh, human organization contribute or can actually mitigate uh, disaster a bit. Um, also to show how you have a knack for uh, tapping into the attention economy, I think a very uh, good example is your book cover. And um, let us uh, look at it for a, a short moment. Um, and please, Neil, tell us what we are looking at. If we could show the uh, book cover, please. Yeah, there it is. Well, that uh, photograph, which I uh, wanted to use as the cover of the uh, US edition, and it's been used, I guess, also in the Dutch edition, was taken, I think, in 2017 uh, in Oregon. The photographer uh, stumbled upon a group of golfers coolly finishing their golf game, even as a wildfire raged uh, uh, less than a mile away. It looks a bit closer in the photograph. And when I saw that photograph, I thought it beautifully captured one of the oddities of, of disaster, that when a disaster begins, often we are oblivious to it or in denial about it. And I felt that uh, a book of disasters uh, that uh, was to be published uh, at the time of COVID should uh, convey this important reality. For many people, uh, denial has been a permanent state through this pandemic. There are Americans, for example, and some Europeans who insist uh, that uh, COVID is some kind of hoax uh, perpetrated by uh, governments that want to increase their power over individual citizens. I was walking on a beach in South Wales in the United Kingdom just a few weeks ago, and my nine-year-old son found on the beach a large stone uh, which had written on it in large black letters, COVID hoax. Now, I'm not sure how many people uh, the author expected to see this stone, but the Fergusons saw it, and we thought it was a beautiful <laughs> illustration of the cognitive dissonance that exists in a crisis. Yeah. Some people want to keep playing golf even as the fire rages. At the same time, it's an image that's also, it, it's uh, gone viral several times over the last few years, but mainly because it's such a uh, symbolic picture for climate change and our handling of it. And you at the same time have been quite a contrarian voice, or at least uh, 
uh, leaning somewhat to the more skeptical side of it. Was, it. was the choice for this image also a kind of play with that position uh, in that debate? Well, I think it's important to recognize that the probability of the worst case scenario as uh, depicted by the Intergovernmental pan Panel on Climate Change has gone up uh, over the last uh, 10 or 20 years. And I am not somebody who diminishes the significance of this danger. My point in doom is that it's not the only thing that we should be worrying about. And if we insist on focusing only on the dangers of climate change, then we're likely to be somewhat myopic about other uh, yeah. and sometimes faster moving threats. And that was very obvious last year. In January of 2020, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland. The agenda was dominated by climate change. Greta Thunberg was the central figure at the uh, event. And the, the pandemic had already begun. And it was a little surreal to me at any event to be discussing the problems of climate change when a lethal virus was rapidly spreading around the world. So it's not that I in any way deny or diminish the threats of climate change. The problem is that there are other things that can happen faster than yeah. climate change. And we really need to pay attention to those too. Yeah, we, we will get to that cheerful tour of all other disasters that's, uh, that, that are awaiting us. Uh, first, for the viewers, what we're going to do tonight is probably good to lay out a little bit. Uh, Neil's going to uh, do a short presentation of his book, uh, a deep dive, but brief deep dive, about 10 minutes. And after that, uh, I will continue the interview. I will uh, uphold the proud Dutch tradition of uh, being rude and interruptive, even during your presentation. Uh, and basically, we're going to uh, unpack three big themes tonight. One is, of course, what the pandemic really taught us about how we handle disasters. Um, the second one uh, revolves around networks, a central theme in many of your books, and I think a very important theme to delve into when it comes to pandemics and, and disaster management. And um, my personal hobby, the future, uh, and your, uh, also uh, your, your personal interest, uh, uh, if I look at your book, the future of disasters. What do we know when looking at the past and looking through the, this lens of uh, complexity science and network science about what's awaiting us. Uh, we have a little over an hour for this conversation, uh, so buckle up. Um, and uh, so take it away, Neil. Um, uh, please do present your uh, general theory of disaster to us. Well, uh, I'll do as best a deep dive in 10 minutes as I, <laughs> as I can, uh, Walter. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just uh, very briefly outline what seem to me the key ideas uh, of this book. One of my motives in, in writing it was to put uh, the current disaster in some kind of historical perspective. Uh, it seems uh, if one reads the newspapers like one of history's great disasters. Uh, in fact, to date, this pandemic has killed 0.05% of the world's population, which compares uh, almost as a rounding error uh, when one looks at the Black Death or the plague of Justinian uh, in the sixth century, where the numbers may have run as high as a third of the world's population. In fact, this pandemic has only just overtaken the 1957-58 Asian flu. It'll uh, end up uh, being a larger disaster than that, but it won't catch up with the 1918 Spanish influenza, which I think will end up and will remain an order of magnitude larger. If, if I may, what? Neil, um, hmm. th this is actually quite a striking point you're making here because we've been uh, inundated with uh, coverage about the coronavirus as if it was uh, a major disaster, a major uh, uh, crisis. But you're now showing that according to these data, it might have uh, been more close to a dress rehearsal or um, somewhat of a fire drill more than an actual catastrophe. Well, clearly there have been many worse uh, pandemics in history, and it's, it, it's remarkable that it's only just overtaken the 1957-58 Asian flu, because nobody remembers that. that let me illustrate the point again uh, with British data that we can take all the way back to the 1840s. If you just look for spikes in mortality relative to a 10-year average, uh, as I do in this chart here, you can see that 2020 is a bad year up there with 1918, 1940, and, and 1951. You probably know what's going on in 1918 and 1940, but it's not easy to tell 
uh, what happened in 1951, because we've entirely forgotten uh, the very, very severe influenza of that year uh, in the UK. The key point to make about COVID is that the economic costs have been much greater uh, than the public health costs. That is to say, if all you knew was the death toll, you would be very surprised at the cost of the pandemic. Uh, Larry Summers published a paper last year estimating the cost to the United States, at something like 90% of gross domestic product. That's a vastly larger figure than the 3.5% uh, contraction that the US economy experienced last year. And I want to try and uh, explain why that is briefly. Uh, basically, uh, the Im impact of the lockdowns uh, in terms of its fiscal and monetary cost was like that of a world war. Uh, because uh, by telling people you can't leave home, you can't work, uh, by imposing a whole series of restrictions, we caused an enormous economic shock, much, much larger than anything in the 1950s or indeed in 1918-19. So one of the key points the book makes, which is nicely captured uh, in this chart, that is that, that a man-made disaster like a war and a natural disaster like a pandemic are not that different, actually. The cartoonist here, an American cartoonist, makes the, the analogy between a German machine gunner at Chateau Thierry uh, killing American soldiers and a, and a North Carolinian ki killing Americans by sneezing. And I, I love that image mm. because it gets to one of my central ideas, that, that the distinction between a natural and man-made disaster may in fact be a a false dichotomy. Just to carry on the point, and then you can interrupt me in your Dutch way, Walter. Uh, <laughs> if you compare uh, COVID with wars, uh, it, it's nowhere close to a world war. It's more like the Korean War in terms of uh, its total mortality. So uh, this is not a first tier a global disaster when you compare yeah. it with wars. Well, and, but and, if you and, look at the, just let me finish this point because it's, it's crucial. If you look at the fiscal impact, whether you look at the US uh, or UK or Europe, the fiscal impact looks like a world war. If all you knew about US uh, history was the trajectory of the federal debt relative <laughs> to gross domestic product, you would think World War III had begun perhaps in 2008 and was ongoing. So that's a key point of the book, that economically this has been a much larger disaster than it has been in terms of public health by historic standards. Yeah, policymakers um, would argue that uh, it was worth the cost because of, we, because of the lives and, and livelihoods saved and because of uh, the, the monetary measures that were in place to um, uh, absorb the shock to some extent. One of the key things I show in the book is that there's actually no correlation between the stringency of government measures and the outcome in terms of uh, lives lost. Uh, the, the Oxford Blavatnik School allows you to see that very clearly. Uh, in fact, there were ways of avoiding lockdowns. Uh, the Taiwanese and South Koreans were able to avoid lockdowns for most of uh, the pandemic by using large-scale testing and contact tracing, efficient isolation of potentially infected people and protection of the vulnerable. We didn't do that really in any Western country. And so what ha happened was that lockdowns were this last minute, middle March 2020 uh, panic measure uh, after the smart measures had not been taken. And that then necessitated this huge expenditure because you'd actually t told a large proportion of the population, you cannot work. Yeah. Uh, you cannot earn money. And so there really was no alternative but to do this enormous expenditure. But the key point is that's never happened before in any previous pandemic. So we've ended up with a pandemic that in financial terms looks a lot like a world war. Um, here's the key point. But, sorry sorry at, to interrupt you, yes, Neil, but the point you're making here is quite explosive, really, because what you're arguing is that uh, the lockdowns have not proven very effectively in mitigating this disaster at all. They, they were a last resort. I'm not saying that they were ineffective, but they were not by any means the optimal measure. They were the last resort when the smart options had been effectively forfeited by hesitation, delaying, and a failure to act swiftly. And the way I can illustrate this point is by showing you the COVID-19 stringency data for a selection of countries, uh, which essentially measures how strict the lockdowns were uh, 
the the country with the best outcome in terms of mortality taiwan had the lowest stringency of any of the countries in this sample uh india had very high stringency uh, last year but ended up having a complete disaster this year so if you simply measure lockdown stringency there's absolutely no correlation between outcomes uh that's not to say that we could have done nothing or should have done nothing it's just that there were smarter things that we could have done and very few western countries uh, indeed no western country in fact did the right things last year um, uh, a, a lot of people here in europe watch the the, the the american policies with no lockdowns or uh, less stringent lockdowns as not being very successful either so it, it raises a very complex picture here uh, about how uh, governments should handle disasters like this, right? It does indeed, and I don't want to oversimplify it uh, in the 10 minute talk. The book does its best to show that uh, if you go back through the sequence of events uh, in, in 2020, the right and most efficient response at the beginning of the pandemic was very rapid ramping up of testing, use of contact tracing, quarantining of suspected infected people and protection of the vulnerable. And that was done in a handful of countries. Taiwan and South Korea were probably the front runners. New Zealand also followed their example. No Western country did that. Uh, and in fact, during January, February and into March, most Western public health experts didn't really uh, come up with a credible strategy. Uh, and it was only in mid-March when the other Neil Ferguson published his famous report projecting 2.2 million deaths in the US, that the yeah. lockdown suddenly became the, uh, the widely used policy. And remember, it, there were many important states in the United States that did lock down strictly, particularly New York, but also California, where I usually live. Uh, so the US was a very uh, mixed picture with some states effectively having European style astringency and others, of course, uh, having much less. The yeah. end of this experiment, of course, uh, is an ironical one because the countries that did really quite badly at repressing or controlling the spread of the virus did well when it came to developing and distributing vaccines. Uh, and so nobody really gets an A grade. Uh, in the end, it was actually uh, the countries that had done badly last year that have done well this year. And of course, the US is now uh, leading a global recovery, uh, rather to the surprise of many Europeans who assumed smugly that the US had done disastrously and Europe had done very well. But I want to switch away from the, the COVID discussion to something broader, because I really don't want to leave the impression that this is a book about COVID. Rather, it's a book that helps you see our current predicament in perspective. Uh, and what I'll, I'll do while I still have time, and if you don't interrupt me too often, Walter, is, <laughs> is introduce you to three animals. The first, the gray rhino. And the point I want to make is that we saw a pandemic coming. We often see disasters coming towards us. Uh, uh, th there was no shortage of predictions of disaster. And yet when the pandemic actually struck, and this is often the case, we were taken by surprise and it changed from being a predictable gray rhino into being an unexpected black swan, something that seemed uh, almost impossible. And I want to try and show in the book why that happens, why it is that you can predict a pandemic year after year after year, and yet when one happens, you're shocked, astonished, and you start saying it's unprecedented. Uh, a key variable that I would love to just spend a moment on is, is of course, human error. And this is a book that look, looks at some of the most famous small-sized disasters, the sinking of the Titanic, the destruction of the Hindenburg airship, and talks about what it is that causes a disaster. The argument I wanna make is that all disasters are somewhat similar regardless of their size. There is often some kind of role for human error. Uh, nearly always there's some element of, of human error. The difficulty is identifying which human or humans to blame. Uh, and often I think a mistake that gets made is that we blame the person at the top uh, you will, I'm sure, in the Netherlands have read, as I have in the US, many articles saying that the reason COVID was very bad in the US or Brazil or the UK or India was the dreadful populists who were in charge in those countries. Now, I accept that those leaders made many, many mistakes, but I don't think those mistakes were the key to the high excess mortality in the countries that they governed. 
And the general argument that the book makes is that disasters tend not to be caused at the top. Some are. Some clearly emanate uh, from the, the person at the top. You can't have the Holocaust without Hitler. You can't have the Great Famines without Stalin and Mao. But I think more often than not, uh, the real point of failure in, in a disaster is not at the top. And my favorite example of this in the book is the case of the Space Shuttle Challenger, which blew up, as you will recall, in 1986 at the loss of seven people, the crew, not a huge disaster by any means, but a famous one. Uh, and the book explains the story. You'll have to read the book to find out the full story, but makes the key point that the point of failure was not President Ronald Reagan. It was the minor NASA bureaucrat, the enigmatic Mr. Kingsbury, who changed the estimate of a probability of failure from one in a hundred, which was what the engineers thought, to one in a hundred thousand. Uh, a one in a hundred risk of failure made it almost inevitable that a space shuttle would blow up. If it had been one in a hundred thousand, there never would have been such a disaster or it would have been very, very unlikely. Now, yeah. I know we're short of time, so let me uh, connect the dots in my final remarks. On paper, the United States was very well prepared for a pandemic. It was the best prepared country in the world, according to a survey published by the Economist Intelligence Unit. But the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness, whose one job it was to prepare for a pandemic, sort of knew that that preparedness was phony. If we don't build this, he said in a lecture in 2018, meaning some meaningful policy against uh, a pandemic, we're going to be SOL, which is short for shit out of luck, should we ever be confronted with it. The argument I make in the book is that the illusion of preparedness, the belief that we had a plan, was in fact one of the reasons that things went so wrong in the United States. Similar story in the UK, in fact, a similar story in many Western countries. But there's, a there also seemed to have been a preparedness plan that didn't work. Neil, there also seemed to have been quite the interaction between the, the bottom up failures and the top down failures, uh, especially if you look at leadership in, uh, in the States. One could argue that it didn't contribute to uh, the betterment of the situation, right? Sure. No, I don't think Trump helped, uh, but I think it would be a great mistake uh, to conclude that if we'd had Joe Biden as president a year early in January 2020, there would not have been 600,000 American deaths. And that's the counterfactual that's implicit in the very heavy criticism that's been directed against Trump. As I say in the book, he made numerous mistakes, some of them quite extraordinarily stupid. But the key to what caused large-scale death in the United States was not presidential decision-making. It was the Centers for Disease Control that failed to uh, ramp up testing in early 2020. There was no attempt to build an effective contact tracing system, even although the United States has the biggest technology companies on the planet. There was a complete failure uh, to enforce quarantines uh, across the United States. Uh, and finally, there was a, a disastrous failure to protect the elderly in elderly care homes, as in Europe. Yeah. None of that can be traced to the president's decision making. And those are the main things that caused the excess mortality in the two great waves that happened. So I don't let Trump off the hook. He did a very poor job, and it's why he lost the presidential election. But if you tell yourself, all we need to do is get a better president and the problem solved and we, and we won't have another such disaster. That's delusional. Uh, and actually, Ron Klain, who's Joe Biden's chief of staff, acknowledged this uh, in 2019. He, had, he admitted uh, that if the swine flu of 2009 had been as bad, had been as lethal uh, a pandemic as uh, COVID, then there would have been a public health disaster under President yeah. Obama. What's Actually, there was a public health disaster under Obama. It was called the opioid epidemic, and mm. it killed almost as many people yeah, that's, as that's, COVID that's, did under, under Trump. That's also a tragedy, of course. Uh, what, what struck me about your presentation and your book now is, uh, for all its breadth, uh, breadth and uh, erudition, it also strikes um, quite a similar tone to uh, much of your previous work, the importance of networks, the importance of complexity, uh, the bottom-up dynamics and uh, sort of um, arguing that history is not made at the top all the time uh, in that sense maybe uh, uh, providing a bit of a, a leeway for, for President Trump 
it, it leads me to the question, what was new for you in terms of insight from this pandemic? What surprised you about this particular disaster? Well, I had never fully understood the significance of the great Indian economist Amartya Sen's point that famines are not natural disasters. Uh, Sen made that point many years ago, uh, and it's a profound insight. The great famines, which I discuss in the book, uh, Ireland uh, in the 19th century or uh, Bengal in the 1940s, uh, Ukraine in the 1930s, China in the 1950s. The, these famines were not really natural disasters, even if there were some initial uh, crop failures. They, they really led to mass death because of, of decisions at a political level. And I think that the key point that Doom makes, which I had not realized before, is that that is generally true. It is not just true of famines, it's true of all disasters, that they have a political dimension. Uh, even if it's only the policy decision to build a city next to a volcano or a massive fault line. So that idea is important because it makes you realize that, that whatever kind of disaster you're looking at, including a pandemic, there is a politics to the disaster. Yeah, you should it's not politics also... that decides the outcome. The same virus struck Taiwan and the United States. But in the Taiwanese case, the death toll until very recently was in double digits. Yeah, you should, uh, and you of course, shouldn't in the only look States, at half a million people die. You shouldn't only look at the biological properties of a virus, but also the societal properties of a virus. And, and uh, in that sense, any disaster, you should look much broader and with a much um, more systemic and network view, right? Before we zoom out and, and uh, get to that perspective, let's uh, end the zooming in part on, on this particular pandemic by laying out what should have been done, in your view, and what countries maybe did a better job uh, from which we can learn. I think that's also quite a nice segue into the zooming out part. Well, as I said, no country really gets an A, because countries that did well when it came to controlling the spread of the virus last year have not done well when it came to vaccination this year. Mm. Taiwan's a good example of this, and, and Taiwan is one of the countries that I talk about quite a bit in the book, partly because I think the Taiwanese have shown that it's possible to use technology to deal with the public crisis in ways that don't limit individual freedom, but actually empower citizens. And that's very important because often I heard in the United States and in the UK, arguments that said, we can't use contact tracing apps because those pose a threat to our civil liberties. I thought those arguments were very unconvincing, coming from people who were being locked in their homes for weeks at a time. Uh, if, if that's a triumph of civil liberties, then I'm confused. The Taiwanese were able to avoid that precisely by using technology intelligently. And I think the South Koreans also showed the power of testing and contact tracing early on. The United States and the United Kingdom got a lot wrong last year, but they then proceeded to get the one thing right that really matters uh, in a pandemic. And that, of course, is vaccination. When I was writing the book, we didn't even have the phase three results from Pfizer. But my guess was, and I think it was right, that the Western vaccines, particularly the mRNA vaccines, would be a lot better than the Chinese vaccines. And that's turned out to be true. So I think when one looks back on uh, over the last 18 months, one can see that nobody really got this right. Taiwan was a victim of its own success. So to an extent were other neighboring countries, they got the first phase right, and then they waited too long with vaccination and found themselves vulnerable when the new Delta variant began to spread uh, around the world. Yeah. I think the broad lesson I would offer all Western governments, including the Dutch government, uh, is to look at the ways in which the public health response in South Korea and Taiwan was superior. Because we'll certainly face another pandemic again in the foreseeable future. And we must make sure that we respond much more efficiently than we did. Because lockdowns are, a, as I said, a last resort when you failed to do the smart things in the early phase of the outbreak. Yeah, and well, let's delve in uh, Taiwan and South Korea then. If there's one unifying principle in those countries that really helped them cope much better, significantly better than any other country in the world. What was it? What, what was their lens through which they perceived this pandemic, uh, uh, which helped them cope with it? 
Well, I, I thought a lot about that question and I came to realize that, that they have something in common. Uh, and one might also add Israel to this list because mm. the Israeli response has been on the whole pretty good too. What they have in common is that they are generally paranoid. That is to say, they have very good reasons to worry yeah. about what their neighbors might do to them. And that, that's made them quick. So what strikes me most, and I had been in Taiwan at the beginning of 2020, is the speed of response. Uh, the, and also the skepticism towards the Chinese claim in January that there was no human to human transmission. We naively believed the World Health Organization, which naively believed the Chinese Communist Party. The Taiwanese have too many reasons not to trust the Chinese Communist Party. So the overall conclusion is that it's better to be quick and to be quick to have a rapid response. You have to be generally somewhat paranoid because you don't know what form the next disaster is will it, take. Is it, is it really paranoia though? Uh, another book that you quote in your book uh, by Peter Turchin, uh, an historian who lays out the cyclical nature of uh, conflict and war and peace. Uh, a central theme in his work is uh, the term asabiya, which is an Arabic term meaning the propensity to be able to act collectively, often out of a sense of urgency from a uh, shared enemy, but not necessarily so. Do, do, do you see that sense of asabiya, uh, the, the shared collective urge to, to act together, as, as an important part in, in the solution or not? Yes, and I think it, it's associated with this sense of vulnerability of, a, mm. of an enemy that is uh, close to you, uh, threatening you in multiple ways, uh, whether you're Taiwan or South Korea or Israel, you have reason to be not necessarily paranoid, I use that term in an unscientific way, uh, but at least quick to respond to any threat because you know that there are people out to get you. And I think the complacency that we see in Western Europe and in North America, I think comes from a, a, a lack of that sense of urgency. And I would contrast these elaborate pandemic preparedness plans that existed in Europe and in the US uh, with the speed of response that, that characterized the, 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 the best uh, responses in, in East Asia. Uh, there's a great line from the movie version of Catch-22, which you may uh, remember, it's not in the book by Joseph Heller, but it's in the 1970s movie where the, the line is just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't out to get you. And I, I think that that's how they feel uh, in Taiwan, yeah. in South Korea and, and in Israel. And, and it, it helps because you don't know which form the next threat will, will take. Yeah. And that's a really big difference between my work and Peter Turchin's work. Peter, whom I greatly respect, thinks that there are cycles of history that have some predictable quality to them. But my view is quite different. Uh, while there may be some cyclical forces at work, disasters are too unpredictable, too random in their incidence, uh, in too many different forms, for there to be a predictable cycle of history. And you can't predict the next disaster. You can try, you can build your model, but you'll probably be wrong because there really is no predictability to the next big earthquake, the next big volcano, the next big wildfire. These things are very, very difficult, maybe impossible to predict. Even the next big war is, as we know from the work of L.F. Richardson many years ago, impossible to predict because there is no predictable cycle of conflict, much and, as and, we would like to find one. And the, the only cure for that unpredictability is to be thoroughly paranoid all the time. That's basically where you say and quick, because I think what's yeah. really interesting about, about a disaster is that you can't predict it, but you can be quick to respond to the initial tremors uh, in the case of an earthquake. Uh, you can be quick to respond to the initial signs of trouble. I wasn't uh, too um, surprised that a pandemic developed last year after the initial signs uh, from Wuhan there were enough reasons to be very worried by the second or third week of January. Uh, and, it, it, and yet we did not really take decisive action in most Western countries until March. Yeah. So it's all about rapid response. And Larry Brilliant, the great epidemiologist, put this very succinctly. He said the key in the new pandemic of a novel pathogen is early detection and early action. And that's what they got right in Taiwan and South yeah. Korea and what very few Western countries came well, what, close to. What struck me uh, about the countries that succeeded and also the people that I follow on Twitter or social media or generally the people in the public uh, 
discussion and debate about uh, this pandemic, the people that got it right all the time, or most of the times, were people from the complexity sciences, from the network sciences, people who thoroughly understand exponential developments and exponential growth, sublinear processes, uh, uh, be it in, in biology, ecology, or uh, computer science. And that's also an important thread in, in your work, right? Uh, is, is a broadening of the perspective from only uh, seeing a disaster biologically or socially or politically to a more uh, holistic, systematic view. Uh, I, is that, is that I, am certainly, I am certainly much more interested in complexity uh, and chaos theory and network science than most historians. In fact, one uh, reviewer of the book, uh, Professor Richard Evans, proudly proclaimed his inability to understand these things. Personally, I would be somewhat embarrassed to admit that kind of ignorance. But we can't really do the history of, uh, of infectious disease or the history of, uh, of war, for that matter, if we don't have some understanding uh, of these concepts. Because ultimately, yeah. historians are studying complex systems. That's what a state or an empire uh, is it's a complex system. Yeah, we'll delve uh, into the, the complexity of complex systems and, and the difference between uh, b something being complicated and something being complex and dynamic. Um, but first, I think we have some questions from the audience, Tracy. We do indeed. And this uh, goes back to the issue of preparedness and rapid response. Patricia Lerner asks, uh, the Global Health Security Index 2019 listed the US and the UK as most prepared. Were the wrong questions asked? Were the indicators skewed towards the priorities of high income countries? Interesting question. I, it's a great question. And that, that survey, I think, illustrates one of the big difficulties that we face in assessing something like preparedness. On paper, the United States had a detailed pandemic preparedness plan multiple agencies were involved. Uh, there were indeed multiple plans. Uh, and on paper, therefore, it appeared that the United States uh, not only was prepared, but had the resources to cope uh, in a crisis. The same was true of the UK. Uh, the problem was not, I think, that the uh, assessment was skewed in favor of rich countries. I think it was skewed in favor of bureaucracy, rather than in favor of what I'll call uh, uh, the practiced approach. Ultimately, if you have a plan, but you've never tried it out, or you've had just one simulation, the chances of the plan working are very small indeed. Uh, imagine uh, a military plan uh, that was never used for a training exercise. And I think we essentially had this uh, in the United States, a plan without really meaningful uh, training. And the best illustration of this is the total failure of the Centers for Disease Control uh, to produce testing kits uh, the most important thing to know at the beginning of a pandemic is who has the new pathogen, who has the new virus. You could find that out really quickly in Taiwan and South Korea. They were able to ramp up test production incredibly rapidly. And CDC not only failed to do that, it actually prevented other people producing kits and then produced a testing kit of its own that didn't work. So that was the thing that the 2019 survey missed that bureaucratic preparedness is not the same as real effective preparedness. By the way, Dominic Cummings, uh, who was Boris Johnson's advisor until uh, his departure uh, from government last year, made a very similar critique of the British response. On paper, there was a plan, he said, uh, but half of it uh, was useless and half of it didn't work. And it was too, uh, that's it was the too way to think about this. It was too bureaucratic and uh, a bit uh, too little paranoid and quick in that sense. That, that's right. And, and anybody who's worked in a large organization will know the problem. That if you are uh, engaged in preparedness as a bureaucrat, what you want is a document, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, you've covered your ass because you've produced uh, a detailed blueprint for how to deal with multiple contingencies. But have you stress tested it? Remember the financial crisis, which, as you mentioned earlier, I wrote about in The Ascent of Money? On paper, there were detailed rules governing bank capital adequacy in 2008. It's just that they didn't work at all. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, incentivize risky behavior. So I think what we need to realize is that bureaucratic preparedness, which is often very detailed, which runs for page after page after page, 
is sometimes the disease of which it pretends to be the cure. Uh, it in fact often adds to complexity and reduces the, the necessary flexibility when, when a crisis happens. Do we have more questions from the audience? Uh, I do indeed, and this goes back to uh, uh, the role of policymakers. Uh, it's all interconnected, but we will go on with complexity. As the world is, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Uh, we have a question from uh, Xavier Kriol, and he says, how do we get policymakers to think more long term? What is needed to solve the paradox between short term political and economic gain and the long term of generations? And in this connection, he quotes someone whom uh, Wouter recently also interviewed, the cathedral thinking of Roman Kazarnik. The problem is that the democratic system does not incentivize long term thinking. Uh, Henry Kissinger once made this point brilliantly uh, in his problem of conjecture, uh, something he came up with in the 1960s before he'd really served uh, at high in high office. Uh, and his point is this, that if you're a, a, a statesman, a politician, a decision maker, and you see some risk of disaster, uh, you can take action today to preempt that disaster. But that has some cost. Uh, that, that cost, of course, is going to cost you popularity uh, because you'll have to impose the cost on at least some voters. Uh, and the worst of it is that if you're right and you avoid the disaster, there is no gratitude. People are not grateful for things that don't happen. Nobody looks back and says what a terrific President George W. Bush was because there was only one 9-11 and no subsequent large-scale terrorist attack. Therefore, the democratic politicians tempted to kick the can down the road and hope the disaster won't happen uh, because taking preemptive action just doesn't give you a significant political reward. But this there, is there the central be, problem of the climate change debate. But there seems to be a paradox here because uh, the, the cost of lockdowns were uh, caused effectively by being preemptive. Correct. The right. cost of so, action after the fact is much higher. In the case of World War II, earlier action, which Winston Churchill recommended in 1938, even in 1936, would have had a much lower cost than the action yeah. that had to be taken in 1939 to 45. Yeah. So ultimately, we have a fundamental systemic problem, which is that we are reluctant to elect the kind of people who can persuade us to make early sacrifices to avoid much larger ones later. Uh, and I think it's only fixable if you can at least some, in some ways change the incentives for the bureaucracies, the non-elected officials. And that's an important thing, not only uh, in, in North America and in Europe, but in most democracies. There, there are key officials who are not elected, who don't have to run for office. Why is it that their incentives also seem to be skewed? Because I think that can be fixed. And this is one of the things that makes Taiwan interesting. Audrey Tang, as the digital minister there, has pioneered the use of technology to increase the accountability of government to citizens and to empower citizens, involve them even in decision making. And that has been very successful, not just with respect to public health, but in a whole range of different policy areas. So I think we'll never change the incentives of politicians. We, yeah. we just have to do a better job as voters of distinguishing the charlatans uh, from the competent leaders. But we can, I think, create better incentives uh, for bureaucracies to make uh, non-elected officials take better decisions than they seem to have taken uh, in the last 18 months. And what, what can we learn from complexity science uh, in terms of what actions can be taken and how we should perceive uh, risk and disaster and, and, and doom coming our way? Uh, Audrey Tang, the minister of Taiwan you mentioned, she is famous for a lot of things, but also because of her complexity mindedness. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's good to give us a little bit of uh, complexity 101 and why it's important and uh, relevant in situations like we had in the past year. Well, complex systems are very difficult to uh, predict the behavior of. Uh, you, you can try to model them. That's, after all, what climate scientists are, are doing. But it's extremely difficult because of all the nonlinear relationships. Uh, the processes are ultimately almost too complex to model. And there's very large uncertainty around any kind of uh, forecast about climate change for that reason. But, but the Earth's climate is only one of many complex systems that we have to deal with. 
uh, and ultimately the big political systems of the world are also uh, complex systems and they're hard to predict too. Think of all the people who confidently predicted the results of, uh, of recent American elections. So there's political complexity that we have to navigate too. I would say one way of thinking about the world is as a world with a very high vulnerability to contagion. Not only contagion of the sort caused by a new virus, but also the kind of contagion that leads to crazy ideas, fake news, conspiracy theories spreading rapidly uh, through the internet. And we have to deal with these two different kinds of contagion simultaneously. A complex system needs circuit breakers. If you think of the network as something that can spread a disease or a crazy idea very rapidly indeed, there need to be ways much more quickly to interrupt transmission if you think that there is a serious outbreak of a new virus. That is elementary computer security, yeah. uh, but it is not elementary public health security. Think of all the continued travel that took place in early 2020 when it really would have made sense to, to restrict travel much earlier than happened. And it was controversial even when Trump argued for a travel ban on China, uh, from China. Actually, that was the right thing to do. He just recommended it about two weeks too late. So complex systems need to have circuit breakers or the contagion problem can overwhelm them. Yeah, so, so the main point is that in uh, complex and interconnected systems, you need breaks. And uh, to some extent, um, increased complexity asks for simplicity above all, in the sense that you can simply switch off parts of the system. But you have to understand the network structure to do that. Uh, yeah. and, and that's the, the, the thing that very few organizations do. Most organizations imagine themselves as pyramids, organization charts with the boss at the top and uh, layers of, of bureaucracy leading down to the lowliest work, worker. But in reality, that's not what organizations look like. They, they, are, they are social networks. Uh, some nodes, some individuals in the network are much more connected than others. Understanding the network structure of, for example, a large city is important. If you get an outbreak of a new disease in one part of the city, if you understand the network structure, then you can much more effectively cordon off that area. The Taiwanese had a plan for that, for Taipei, which was fascinating to me because it reflected the fact that they thought deeply about how transmission would occur. New York City has nothing of that sort, but we can see how the COVID uh, disease spread in New York through the public transport network. We even know which line, the flushing line, yeah. did the most spreading. Yeah. But there's no policy in place uh, in, in New York to create that kind of circuit breaker in, in a case of contagion. And, so and how, that's the way I would, would think about this problem uh, if one were trying to formalize it. How would circuit breakers look like in, in any public policy, aside from just shutting off a metro line, but uh, in, in, in the, the future disasters that are awaiting us? How can we implement circuit breakers and uh, uh, this complexity lens in order to be prepared better? Well, this is where I come back to the, the way in which we train our public servants. At the moment, we tend to train people in uh, administrative jobs in the law. That's especially true in the United States. We tend not to equip them very well with tools like network science. So we have an education problem. It's, it's partly that we don't teach uh, our public servants much history, uh, but we also don't really teach them much of the kind of tools that, that would be useful for understanding these fundamental policy problems. So one concrete proposal uh, that comes out of Doom is that we really need to change the things that we teach the people who provide public services. And actually it would help too if uh, we improve the training of the people who go into large corporate bureaucracies because these same problems arise in any large organization. It's not just a problem in government. So my hope is that we can develop over the coming years a kind of applied history that we can teach people. I, I would yeah. like public servants to study past pandemics and in the same way, introduce them to concepts like network science, which are, I think, a part of the way Taiwan approaches public policy, but clearly are not part of the way that most Western governments do. Yeah, so learn the lessons from the past in order to have a safer future. So let's run uh, by this future. Let's, oh, maybe we, we should go to some questions of the audience first, and then we'll delve into my personal hobby, the future. Okay. <laughs> it's all our, it's our personal hobby of all of Isn't us. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, we have an interesting question from um, Eric Smock. Uh, 
who notes the fact, which occurred to me too when you were uh, talking, Neil, Western bureaucracies have been scaled down as responsibilities have been delegated to the market. That means, on the one hand, there is less bureaucracy, but it also means that there's less competence and less confidence in the bureaucrats. Is this true? Well, yes and no. It's it's this is the the the, the difficulty with uh, that the criticism of what's sometimes called neoliberalism, that that although it's the case that there is a smaller state in some respects uh, than there was in say the 1950s or 60s, when you look closely, uh, it's not necessarily the case that uh, they've, they've shrunk the public health uh, agencies. Actually, uh, in some ways, those agencies have grown larger. The Centers for Disease Control is definitely a bigger organization than it was in the 1950s. The Department of Health and Human Services is a bigger organization than it was. Public health is certainly a larger, employs more civil servants than was true uh, in the 1950s. Uh, the shrinkage has occurred in other areas, actually, uh, rather than health. But one thing is certainly true uh, that has has definitely changed. If one compares the 1950s when the great influenza pandemics last happened, there's a lot less hospital capacity in many countries than there used to be. I think that's a different point. My own sense is that the problems of bureaucracy that I'm talking about exist in the private sector as well as in the public sector. If one looks at the way that large organizations function, uh, it's actually not that different. You get the same pathologies of, of bureaucratic behavior, the generation of paperwork, meetings about meetings, and, 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 and a reluctance to engage in, in stress testing, in, in actual drills. These things seem to happen regardless of whether you privatize something or not. So I don't think that's quite the problem. It's not the size of government that is the issue. Uh, there's no correlation between the size of of the health service and performance in the face of, of COVID, for example. But it is a kind of natural behavior of human organizations to become more sclerotic and less uh, resilient in, in that sense. Yeah, I think that's a, an old idea that goes back to, to Mansa Olson and others who saw that over time institutions would tend to degenerate. Uh, that was why Olson thought Japan and Germany had done so well after World War II because everything had been destroyed and they could start over. The problem with that argument is that it implies the only way that you could fix the United States is for it to be defeated in a world well, war, which and, and it seems like a pretty drastic response. And it raises in interesting questions about the cyclical nature of history because uh, it would also lead to the idea that uh, after a while uh, institutions will have to be replaced somehow and the history of institutional replacement has not been very friendly. Well, I'm, I'm a believer that, that evolution is better than revolution and that actually institutions can fix themselves. Uh, think of the way the US military fixed itself after Vietnam. I mean, I think actually COVID has been Vietnam to most public health systems uh, in the Western world. And they need as radical a, a, an overhaul as the uh, US military did uh, after Vietnam. So things can be fixed without uh, a, a full scale revolution or defeat in, in war, and it's certainly preferable to do it that way. Uh, the UK is a country I grew up in, which by the 1970s appeared in a state of almost total sclerosis, economically as well as socially, but under Margaret Thatcher, significant reforms occurred that, that really did transform the performance of the UK, but, uh, but and not only economically. So you can fix things without revolution or, or full-blown military defeat, thankfully. Yeah, but I think that Thatcher... Uh, example might also show that uh, yesterday's solutions are the cause of today's problems to some extent as well. Right? So there might be uh, an interaction, a cyclical nature to institutional reform. Uh, well, I certainly think it's a mistake for conservatives to believe that the ideas of the 1980s will always be relevant and always be applicable. I mean, one thing that's very clear from recent survey data that I've just been looking at for the Centre for Policy Studies here in London is that there is really very little political appetite amongst voters for the uh, slogans of, of uh, or indeed the arguments of the mm -hmm. 1980s. Mm -hmm. So yeah, things change, they, they, they evolve and you need to come up with new answers because the problems are in many ways different. Uh, ultimately populism, which had a great surge of success politically in 2016 and afterwards, was a response to political and public frustration with bureaucratic systems. That was why Trump's followers wanted to drain the swamp, 
That was why there was a, a, a desire to take back control in Britain from Brussels. Ultimately, these populist solutions have not solved the problem. Uh, in the end, Trump was not a solution to the problem of the administrative state. Uh, but we haven't solved the problem. Uh, we still see the administrative state uh, expanding its remit. We'll see this under Joe Biden. There are going to be any number of plans that will expand the scope of the federal government. I'm skeptical yeah. that these will be very successful, frankly, because I don't think the federal government is an agency that's very good at taking on new tasks. At the this same is not the federal government of Dwight Eisenhower. At the same time, the, the vibe that we got uh, from across the pond, uh, from the United States, at least in January, January of this uh, year was rather more revolutionary than evolutionary change down there, right? So, Well, let me take the opportunity to show you my final slides because it's a great moment to introduce you to, to the Dragon Kings. That, Have I really that I interrupted you before. that long, Neil? This will take you just a second, uh, but it's actually kind of cool because it gets us to your future that you want to talk about, Walter. So, as I said, some, some disasters are grey rhinos, we see them coming, uh, and some are black swans, they take us by surprise. But then there are the dragon kings, and these are the disasters so enormous that they lie outside even a so-called power law distribution. And I want to try and uh, make the point about COVID that uh, it could have much bigger political consequences than its public health consequences, or even its economic consequences. Think of the Peasants' Revolt after uh, the Black Death in England uh, in the 1380s. Think of the Russian Revolution, which is in many ways the, the biggest consequence of World War I, a, a consequence greater than the, the actual death toll of the event. And for me, the big question of 2020 was how big were the political consequences going to be? Mm. After the death uh, of George Floyd, we saw an extraordinary and indeed revolutionary situation in many parts of the United States. It created a tremendous wave of, of expiation uh, as well as of protest. In almost every part of the United States, there were protests, uh, as this map from the New York Times shows. Yeah. And I think it's still not wholly clear how profound the consequences of that event will be. They were global, they extended to Europe, they extended to the United Kingdom. And here's the paradox which I want to, um, to offer. In a disaster, there is certainly a potential for revolution, but there's also a desire for normalcy, to return to normalcy. And that was, I think, one of the reasons that Joe Biden got elected. He was the normalcy candidate, just as Warren Harding was 100 years previously, after the 1918-19 uh, influenza. He was Republican, but he was a, a normalcy candidate after the uh, really quite revolutionary presidency of Woodrow Wilson. So this seems to me to get to where you want to go out or into the broader question of, of, of the future scenarios that we have to grapple with. Because yeah, let's get that crystal ball out. Even the political consequences have been hard to predict. So let's get that crystal ball out and maybe run us by uh, a couple of the disasters that you see coming and uh, maybe what we can do about them or uh, be, in order to be better prepared for them. And also touch on the point, if you can, Neil, what can we as individuals do about them? Because that was the, the, uh, uh, the point, the gist of a lot of the questions that people sent in. This is also huge and I feel so powerless. What can we as individuals do? Well, let, let me take those two questions one by one. Uh, first, what, what are the things that we need to brace ourselves for? Now, now by definition, you can't predict a black swan. Uh, and by definition, uh, there are too many gray rhinos uh, coming towards us. They can't all happen. Uh, so this is what makes it tricky. He, here's what I think most people are led to expect. The, the next disaster to look like. It, it, it is almost on a daily basis that I'm told that climate change is going to be the divining cause of disaster in the rest of my life. Uh, let's assume that that has 20 years or so to run. And I think it's certainly the case that there will be extreme uh, climatic events uh, in the near future. In fact, I strongly suspect that the wildfire season in California is going to be even worse than last year. It's a cause of considerable anxiety. But here's another thing that people think less about, uh, which I think is, is as important and could happen faster. We are in the midst of something very like Cold War II right now. 
Uh, the US-China relationship has deteriorated seriously, uh, and that was not just uh, because of Donald Trump, it has deteriorated for a whole variety of reasons. And sentiment towards China, as you can see in the charts uh, on the side of the screen, has become far more negative, not only in the US, but all over Europe. And I am very concerned that a crisis over Taiwan is actually quite imminent, could even happen next year, and that there is a non-trivial risk that that escalates uh, into a much larger war than anything that we've seen, certainly uh, since the Korean War of, uh, of 1950. Now, that, that, that's just one of the things to worry about. Part of such a war would certainly be a large-scale cyber war, which would potentially disable a great deal of the critical infrastructure that's come to rely on the internet. Yeah, so those was, are the things that I, I can worry about with, I think, some historical uh, basis. What can I, I do about it? I, I was it's just going to ask you a follow-up question on that, Neil. Would we even recognize a war between China and the US as a war? Or aren't we already sort of seeing, uh, at least in the cyber domain, uh, war-type activities? And um, if there's one lesson from the wars of the future of the past is that they didn't look anything like anybody expected them to look beforehand. That's right. And we need to spend more time than we do thinking about what the war of the future will look like. Uh, certainly, it will have a much larger cyber component than any previous conflict. Uh, it's conceivable uh, that the, uh, the attacks on, on, on infrastructure that we've, we've seen by private non-state actors in recent months are just a kind of warning shot of a much, much larger attack that could come if relations between the US and China were really to deteriorate. Now, I asked myself, how good are our preparedness plans for a major cyber attack? I certainly am not aware of any drills or practices at any institution that I'm involved with. So there may be a preparedness plan, but we sure as heck are not testing it out to see if it will work. I wonder if there's any organization that really has thought what it will do if there's a full-scale outage of, of internet uh, and of, uh, of cell phones. So, so you asked me earlier, and I think it's a really important uh, question, what, what can we as individuals do? And this is something that, that listeners are asking. My own sense is that it's very tempting to retreat into a kind of powerlessness. And that's a lot of people's reaction to the climate change discussion. They, they shrug their shoulders and they say, well, what difference does it really make if I recycle uh, this piece of garbage? It's ultimately futile if, if the Chinese are massively constructing uh, coal burning power stations. So that defeatism is an important part of why we think the end of the world is coming because we just don't feel able to do anything about it. Uh, I think fatalism is the wrong response. Actually, I think we can do much, much better in the way that we deal with uh, emergencies for the reasons that we've discussed. But we as citizens need to demand more of those who are providing public services. We need to be indignant about how badly things have been done in the last 18 months. We mustn't just say, oh, well, that wasn't very nice. Uh, too bad that 4 million people had to die onto the next party. Let's focus on the football. We can't take that kind of attitude. We have to look back and say, why was it that we were well prepared on paper and did really badly in practice? I think that's part of how we should respond. And let's say, uh, as voters and as citizens, not only to the, the politicians, but to the civil servants and to the people who run our corporations, how good are your plans for the next emergency? Can we see the preparedness plan for the California earthquake? What is actually happening with respect to cyber attack? What will happen if the power grid is taken out? We need to ask those questions because ultimately, when the disasters strike, we are the ones who will be affected. It will be our families who will be at risk. So resist fatalism and recognize that there are things we can do as citizens to demand better, more effective responses to disaster. Yeah. Uh, from our leaders. So to summarize you, um, resist fatalism, be critical citizens, be paranoid above all, basically, um, and use that uh, lens of uh, network complexity to understand what's happening, um, and basically don't rely on bureaucracy too much.
That's, well, is don't, that, is that don't be content with reassuring words from public officials along the lines of, don't worry, we have a plan for that. I think those are words that should make every citizen recoil in dismay. Uh, I also, I'll add one final point, if I may. I also think that at, at the level of uh, the street, uh, the village, the town, uh, the family, uh, there actually are more things that we can do uh, to be prepared uh, for adversity. I, I live in a part of the world that is vulnerable to earthquakes, but I'm very conscious since uh, the experience of COVID that we as neighbors in our road need to be a great deal more active in, in preparing for the nightmare scenario of a really big earthquake. And we need to be ready also for the nightmare scenario of a really bad wildfire season. Yeah. And I think one of the lessons of American history which Alexis de Tocqueville was much impressed by when he visited the United States, was that citizens taking responsibility for their own local preparedness often will do a better job, not only in, in, in local politics, but they will do a better job in preparing state and, and, and national readiness for disaster. So I'm in favor of a, a more active approach to the problems that, 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 that you are in, in a position to deal with. Yeah. I think we've all become somewhat passive because the bureaucratic state says, leave this to us. If COVID has taught us anything, it is we cannot leave it to the administrative state because it will not in fact do a very good job. Thank you, Neil. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm quite reassured uh, by, by what <laughs> no, you No, I don't want us. you to be. Uh, I'm more optimistic than the, your book title suggests, I must say. There are some strands of optimism and, and, and solutions in there. I believe we have a few more questions from the audience. Uh, we're out of time now. Out of time. Okay. Yeah. So then I'll give the uh, chair back to yeah. you, right, Stacey? Oh, okay. Tracy. For the closing remarks of today. Mainly, thank you so much, Neil Ferguson, for your insights and your erudition and your independence of thought. And thank you, Walter, for leading this wonderful conversation. Our last event before the summer is on Wednesday, July 14th. Elliot Brown, the Wall Street Journal reporter who brought the WeWork scandal to light, uh, is appearing at the Bertelsmann Foundation in Washington, D.C. online, and we are collaborating with them to bring you that uh, conversation. We will then take a break for the summer, and in September we hope and plan to return with live events. Remember what that Real was ones. like. Real people, warm bodies. <laughs> Not too many, though. <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope lots, but we don't know yet. Our first live event will be on September 15th with Russell Shorto, talking about his book, Small Time, about the history of his family in the mob in Pennsylvania. And after that, on September 2019th, we are happy to welcome Patrick Radden Keefe. You may know him from the wonderful podcast, Wind of Change, about whether the CIA was or was not behind the song Wind of Change as a propaganda tool in uh, post-war Europe. But he is also the author of a book about the opioid crisis, which Neil mentioned earlier in this conversation. The title of his book is Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. And I'm really looking forward to addressing this crisis, which I think has not really had enough attention here in, uh, no. in Europe. I also want to take this moment to thank all of you, our main sponsors and our corporate members, our John Adams family and friends, our members and patrons, and those of you who made a spontaneous donation. I want to thank you for your support and for sticking with us during this difficult period. We are truly grateful. And finally, uh, our newest news, I'm delighted to announce that PricewaterhouseCoopers has joined us as a main sponsor. Together with Egon, Wolters Gluber, Bosco de Loterij, KLM, and the Holland America Friendship Foundation, they will help us bring the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands, which we have been doing for over three decades. And this evening was a perfect illustration of that. Wasn't it? Yeah. It was I indeed. Had a lot of fun. Very uh, food for thought. I would say so. Thank you so much, uh, Neil, for this enlightening Thank you. Uh, conversation. Been my pleasure. Thank you, Neil.